Um, I thought it was interesting. I found this uh, uh, picture called Faith, a Study of the Book of James, Faith Works. And it kind of spoke to my heart because here's a whole lot of woodworking tools and stuff around the edge of the picture. Um, we're going to talk about encouraged by hearing and doing the word and just how critical that is as we try to live out the Christian life. Um, I've often wondered, and I think uh, I, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Joe Widener for taking the class uh, two weeks ago and for Bill Wallace taking it uh, Last Wednesday night, I was gone on both of those Wednesday nights. The first one, of course, was the funeral for Brandon Allman. And then last week I was out of town. So, um, but Bill mentioned something I want to I want to piggyback off of because it's such a neat question to ask, and it has to do with what may have been going on in the life of the church to make uh, what James actually writes in his letter so crucial. Uh, and, and think about this. Every one of the letters in the New Testament are situational. That is that they try to do two things at once. And this always fascinates me because you've got the life situation in the church that James is writing to. But he's not concerned just with a practical um, trying to fix those problems. He's also interested in that his readers understand the mindset of Jesus as they approach those problems. And he's going to be coming at these problems from um, a, a, a faith perspective that's very deeply rooted in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. So the life situation in the church, th this whole section on listening and doing, uh, it may have been, and we're going to see this because we begin to look at uh, some specifics just within this paragraph. But we, we get an indication that we're, there were some specific things wrong and he wants his listeners to be aware of there's more to being a Christian than just listening. That you have to put together the hearing and the doing uh, because you can go to one extreme or the other on either one. You can do a whole lot of hearing, a whole lot of listening, a lot of studying, a lot of memorizing, a lot of Bible reading. So I can just keep on and then not do anything. Or on the other hand, and I just heard a minister say this today, and it's kind of a new problem. Because in a lot of places, you will have churches that get involved in all kinds of community ministries and all kinds of mission work. And they're very, very active but there's very little time for listening to the word or reflecting even on why they did what they did. And it's almost as if we've gone to the other extreme. Um, a lot of uh, individuals prefer doing something as to sitting down and studying. Well, it's almost like the hearing part of the church and the doing part of the church needs to join hands. That's why I'm always for the idea that anytime there's a ministry that needs to be happening, uh, the church as a whole needs to figure out how do we as a body respond to that need? Because it's going to take people that have the gift of listening and discernment, hearing the word. And you're going to need people that know how to do it and do it well. And when you get those two together, some pretty fascinating, wonderful things happen. And uh, unfortunately, we tend to pull those two things apart, and that's not very healthy. Uh, if you look at the movement of chapter 1 already, uh, we've talked about this whole thing of joy in trials um, and how to face temptation. And we're going to be looking at uh, another dimension of being blessed Remember back in chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. That's a pretty important statement because I, my assumption is he's writing to some Christians who are going through a lot of trials. But then, look at part, right in the middle of our section for tonight. This is in verse 25. But the man who looks into, 
looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not only forgetting what he is, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So the readers are blessed if they persevere in trials. Also, the readers are blessed if they go ahead and do what they already believe. And that's a significant uh, insight into what they're struggling with. And it goes along with this bigger issue, and we're going to talk about this quite a bit tonight, uh, issues of what makes true religion. He's going to use the word religion here. Um, it's not very often that the New Testament writers, and I don't know if you've thought about this, uh, this word religion is used very sparingly by the New Testament writers. And I think I know why. At least I'm going to throw out uh, an idea. I think it's because even in, even in James' day, religion was typically thought of as right practice of rituals. And that's why the New Testament writers don't use it very often. And that's why when Peter uses it here, or, or Paul, uh, Peter, Paul, James, when James uses it here, I think he's dealing with some Christians who are beginning to have this idea that true religion is the right religious practices and the right ritual. And that's why he's going to talk about specifically what makes up true religion. And his response to that might be surprising. I, I suspect it was surprising somewhat to his uh, early readers. But also, when we think about the hearing and the doing being drawn together, it reminds us of the power of the word. Not only the human spoken word, but the embodiment of God's word, of Jesus and the spirit within the Christian. That God's word is powerful. The risen Lord as word is powerful. The spirit as the word of God is powerful. And that makes all the difference in the world. Look at this, um, this wonderful passage. I'm sure you've heard of it before. Uh, Isaiah 55. I want to look at Isaiah 55. It's in the section of hope and comfort that we find this. And this is the invitation to those, come to all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, uh, famous passage. Then it talks about the word of the Lord, 5511. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now think about, that's actually an affirmation about God's revelation. Whether it was, uh, in many instances in the Old and New Testament, the very spoken word of God, or the written word of God, or the revealed word of God through Jesus, or the Holy Spirit revealing God's will. However it was revealed, the bottom line is, Lord tells his people in Isaiah 55, through the prophet Isaiah, my word will not return to me void. It is powerful. And that's why, as James is writing this letter to this early Christian community, James knows the power of that word. And so he's going to be bringing them back on occasions. Uh, and, and I think I mentioned this three weeks ago. Uh, oh, and I, and I wrote a little bulletin article on it. There are a lot of people who say, well, and Martin Luther was the worst on this, that um, James is not really a good book to read. I mean, after all, there's not much in Jesus about it. So he, uh, he called it, what was the word he called it? Uh, literally something like a right strawy epistle. He thought it was just as useless as a piece of straw. <laughs> well, a lot of people following him in, Christ, in the Reformation didn't have the same view. But part of that was because he didn't understand the relationship between works and law. Uh, he, he really struggled with that and the works and the gospel. But then also because he thought it didn't say much about Jesus. But if you go through the book of James, there are several things said about Jesus. So that the book itself is a recognition that the word of Jesus sort of permeates everything 
in James. And that helps us whenever we're reading the book itself to remember that. It starts off with the issue of anger. And you may remember whenever we had, was it back last year on a Wednesday night, series of lessons, series of lessons, a whole quarter on learning how to deal with anger. Uh, somebody, and I don't remember who it was, so if it was you, don't feel bad because I can't remember. Somebody came to me after the series and said, I didn't know that we could be angry about so many things. <laughs> but in that study, we looked at the whole dimension of anger. And here, James is going to bring it up. Um, and he starts off by saying, my dear brothers, I want you to take note of this. Now, this is like flashing neon lights when he says this. I want you to take note of this. Okay, we're listening, James. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to listen. Now, that's, most of the time we say, okay, you know, quick to respond. And usually we mean speaking. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And slow to become angry. And verse 20 gives us the reason for that. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Now, we have to be careful with this. He's not saying don't ever get angry. Uh, there are actually individuals, and I've run across them, who have the view that it's, it's sinful to get angry. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Or have you ever kind of thought that? <laughs> sinful to get angry. Well, no, it's not sinful. To get, the, the, the sin comes in if you don't handle it appropriately. Sometimes anger is a good thing. See, think about it. Sometimes anger is because of your feeling that there's an injustice going on. And there's some things you better be angry at. There's some things God's angry at, and justly so. Um, many times, though, our anger is a response to a situation that we're out of control, that we, we don't have control of the situation, and we can't dictate, you know, how. Um, oh, I'll give you an example. <laughs> this was several years ago. Uh, I came in from the outside, and I fell down you know, a whole flight of stairs down to the basement. Oh, and I was hurting. So I just sat there when Nancy came running down, you know, are you okay? And she was, why did you do that? You know, and she was mad at me. So after it was all over with a little while, I said, I'm interested in your anger over this. Talk to me about that. We discovered that, that her immediate reaction of anger was because um, she was scared and, and she had no control over my going down the steps. <laughs> she says, I was afraid you were going to hurt yourself. Um, and, and we're all, so there is that kind of natural anger that flares up. But what, what he's talking about here, what James is talking about, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And you have seen in your lifetime that kind of anger crop up in your own life when maybe you said something out of anger you shouldn't have said. See, and I think what he's dealing with here is how anger expresses itself. It can, it can be very destructive. It can be abusive. It can be physically destructive. Um, it, it, can, it can resort to name calling. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, verbal things that can be connected to anger that are not healthy at all. And this is kind of what James is dealing with. He wants the Christians there to understand that and again, here's another thing I'm surprised at. I mentioned this uh, in, in talking about one of Paul's letters. I'm always amazed at how important issues are that they, that they direct themselves to. This is one of them. Brothers, take note of this. So you know this is very, very important. But do you notice something that's missing? He's writing to this early Christian community and he doesn't give a list of names. Now, I'm assuming if this is written to a congregation with problems going on, when he says brothers, he could have put in parenthesis a list of six or eight or ten brothers that were he was really thinking about, I want you guys to really 
No, he doesn't. It, it's just amazing. Most of the time, names are never given. And I've come to a conclusion on that, I think. I believe that one of the reasons, and James is perfectly uh, illustration like many of Paul's letters, they want their readers to think through what's going on so they in and of themselves can come to the conclusion who all is involved and what steps they need to take. Paul's all about spiritual maturity. And that's a hard thing to get. Uh, it's so much easier sometimes just to lower the boom, name names, get it over with. But who's going to grow that way? And James and Paul and Peter and all of you New Testament writers are very concerned that the readers think enough through this that they can figure out some things for themselves. Uh, and and if, you, if you think about that, um, he's thinking pretty highly of his readers. He's given them enough credit to figure out what he's actually talking about so that they can take the next step and work it out themselves. Okay. Now, look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Now, think about this. See, of course, this is the practice of, you know, people gathering, praying, and if you've ever been in a setting where people raise their hands in prayer, this is the practice, this is the dominant practice of his culture. And you would think he would say something different, like, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer and do it with respect toward God and others. Or, or, or do it by focusing on what's going on and forget the world out there. I mean, there's a lot of different things he could have said. And you think, why would he pick out these two things without anger and disputing? Apparently, Paul at least sees the anger and the disputing, perhaps even being bad enough that it's hindering their prayer life. And the reason there is a lot of anger and disputing going on is because the people that are doing it are not praying people. They're angry disputing people, and they're not praying people. I want you to lift your hands in holy prayer without anger and disputing. It's hard to pray and be angry at the same time. Now, you can have a prayer of anger, um, and sometimes we don't do that enough. Uh, but this, he says this to Timothy, which I think is rather fascinating. Uh, look at Colossians 3.8, and this is going to be a little bit parallel to some things we're going to see in James. But Colossians chapter 3, and this is in the whole section that he calls holy living. But now, he says, oh, he, you used to walk in these ways, and it's stuff that belonged to your earthly nature. Uh, things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. There is so much in different sections of the New Testament concerned about holy living that constantly will raise up what we say with our lips. No malice, you don't slander, you don't gossip, you don't backbite, uh, you don't have anger, you don't use your words with rage. The Christian life um, moderates that. That if we're taking on the mind of Christ, you have to be sensitive to what you're saying. And it's very crucial. And you, you get the impression with all the New Testament letters, that's a constant, ongoing challenge. Because everybody, if you're not careful, let your lips go at times without thinking. Look at Ephesians 4. And this begins verse 26. 
Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we're all members of one another. Now, I love that expression. Paul will use it in Romans, and here he uses it in Ephesians, being members of one another. Now, it, and we talk about being members of the body of Christ. And that's a pretty typical uh, expression, and we think we know what that means. But we're members of one another. We're all members of one body. And that means that because we're members of the same body, what we do affects each other. So, you know, think, think about your body. Um, if, if, if you hurt your little finger, let's say you break your little finger, the rest of your body knows it. <laughs> the body is understood. Even from a medical standpoint, it is a body of systems. And all of those systems are interconnected, okay? It's the same thing with the body of Christ. Uh, you can't have members backbiting, fussing, fighting, anger, malice, rage toward one another without it affecting the whole body. And Paul knows that. Peter knows that. And so does James. And so this is really crucial as James is addressing that in the life of the body of the church. Now, he wants them in chapter 1 to get rid of certain things. Get rid of all moral filth, literally filthiness. And it's, it's interesting, I, I had an insight into the book of James. I always do every time I open it up. It, uh, I love studying the book of James with new Christians. I've done it through the years. When somebody becomes a Christian, they'll say, well, where should I start studying in the Bible? And I love to sit down and just work through James. It's, it's a very practical way of thinking about Christian living. And it seems like every time I open James, I see something I hadn't seen before. Uh, did you know that in chapter 2, in verse 2, when we get to chapter 2, suppose a man uh, comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes. It's the same word for filthy. Filthy clothes, filthy morals. And I get the impression by that, that what James is trying to say, he's alerting his readers to the fact they've got their mind on stuff that doesn't really matter. That it's not the filthy clothes that's the problem. It's the filthy morals, filthy stuff going on, the prevalent evil, he'll use that expression, the evil that is so prevalent among you. And I'm like, whoa, that's strong language. So he's picking out some of this, but he said the, prevalent that is, the evil that's so prevalent among you. He said, that's what you need to be concerned about, not the person coming into your assembly that has the filthy clothes. Boy, he has really hit the juggler vein there, hasn't he? Um, every time I read that, I think of a church where Nancy and I served once. And the situation really broke my heart because... One Sunday morning as I went to the building early and I opened up the building and it was a really cold January morning. I mean, the temperature was like 10 degrees. There was a homeless person sitting in one of the alcoves just getting out of the wind. And one of the leaders of our church saw that and he just came unglued. Get that homeless person out of here. That looks bad for the church. And I was just dumbfounded. That looks bad for the church. That's why we're in business with the church. We have no idea how that person got there. And more than anybody, they need the love of Christ. I mean, that just, uh, to this day, I still hear that and see that situation. Um, and I was, I was so dumbfounded, I don't think I responded the way I should have. And you probably found those situations where something hits you, you, you your, your jaw's on the ground, you don't know what to say or do because you weren't expecting it. Well, um, in Revelation 22, 11, this same idea is used. Go all the way to Revelation 22. It's right toward the end. Then he told me, that's the angel to John. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile, the word vile is filthy. And, and of course, again, he means it here by moral uh, prevalent evil. 
Uh, and, and you say, well, okay, well, why are they supposed to stay that way? Because I'm coming soon, and my reward is to be with me, and I'll give to everyone according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, and it's, it's as if John is saying at the end of Revelation, if you're caught up in an in a evil, filthy, moral kind of lifestyle, um, it's going to be impossible for you to kind of... Um, wipe the slate clean and start over at the last second. When the Lord comes, he's coming. But this, this whole idea that James is addressing is one that's really crucial because it, it deals with um, how you respond to hearing the word. When you hear it, what needs to happen? And I think probably uh, it may be somewhat surprising with the things that he's saying because it is to Christians. Uh, these are strong words to Christians. The evil so prevalent or abounding of wickedness is one literal translation. What James is looking for is a moral lifestyle lived in wisdom. I think Bill last week talked about how that the book of James is considered uh, the New Testament equivalent of Old Testament wisdom literature. And James ha does have a lot of wisdom in it, very practical wisdom. And it's a moral lifestyle that's lived in wisdom. Now, he says we need to humbly accept the word. Don't just listen to it. But in humility, this is crucial. Again, I think James in this whole section is trying to get at true religion. Well, what is true religion? Well, it starts with being... Um, being humble in how you hear the word. In humility, accept the word. Uh, be, uh, receive it and be open to its teachings. Have, I, I'm sure all of you have had this experience. Have you ever been reading a scripture that all of a sudden you're like, man, I wish that wasn't in the Bible because here's how I'm going to have to change. <laughs> because if you're open to the word, uh, it will challenge you. And, there, and when, you, when you understand what's being said, you understand also the implications of where you need to change. And that makes it really difficult. But to accept and receive, to be open to its teachings. And I, and I think this, is, this may be the only place in the Bible, in the New Testament, where we have this expression, um, the implanted word. Accept the word that's planted in you. It's the implanted word. Uh, which can save you. Uh, this idea is the implanted word. It's by God's spirit. It has the power to change you. There's power in the word. Um, to save, that means one's life, their very personhood and their destiny, and your souls. It's interesting. Um, I think the New Testament has a little bit different... Um, Notice here, the NIV, humbly accept the word planted in you. I think it's the word that says literally your soul. Um, and I think the reason that the NIV says you is because it's trying to have this more holistic view of who we are is body, soul, spirit. Uh, we're not chopped up into different individual parts, but... The power of the word is there to save us. And only if we humbly accept it. So there's a humility that goes with uh, accepting what is in the word. Because what he's going to deal with is a fascinating topic here. And it has to do with self-deception. Um, I don't know if you have ever been aware of deceiving yourself about something but I think at some time we all have, that we tried, we, we tried to make ourselves think things were uh, such that that's not really how they were. And self-deception is what he's going to uh, talk about here. And the command, don't merely listen to the word so as to deceive yourselves, but do what it says. The command, be doers of the word, do what it says. Okay, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is a description of worthless religion. 
not doing what it says. That I say I believe something, but really doesn't make any difference. Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. He said, let no one deceive you because it is the doing of the word. Uh, Paul, in several of his writings, wants his readers to be aware they can deceive themselves. And James has picked up on this. Um, and we, if we had time, we could go into some of the other scriptures. But this idea of self-deception, uh, it can go together with pride, which is not surprising later on in the book of James, he's going to talk about pride so that we get self-deception and pride tied together in the book of James. And when you get those two things together, uh, that's pretty bad. We were watching a movie the other night and the lead character in the movie, uh, this lead character was very arrogant and with his own abuse of power, made sure that everybody knew he was right, and everybody had to follow him. Well, the problem was, come to find out, the information he had wasn't right. <laughs> we were watching that, and as a result, several people died because of his decision. And I told my wife, I said, there's nothing worse than arrogant leadership with ignorance. Man. And so in, in this early letter, that James is writing, we're going to see, he's going to highlight two things. Self-deception is very destructive, and pride going along with it makes it even worse. So when you pull those two things together, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a religion that is worthless. And based on that, and some of the things he's going to show a little bit later in chapter 4, not only is it worthless, it is destructive destroys lives in the name of religion. Um, and unfortunately, that happens a lot, that people use religion for their own purposes and people's lives are destroyed. Now, to make his point, he is going to use uh, the simile uh, of a mirror, that you don't want to be just a hearer. Like looking at your face in the mirror, you forget uh, there is this consideration, you just glanced in the mirror, that's all. You're ready to move on. You immediately forgot what you were like, uh, didn't make any changes. And he says, that's what this is like. But there's a flip side of this. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be a blessed kind of doing. And he uses a different word. This is verse 25. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this. Not forget what he has heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. Looked intently. It's the difference between, if you're walking along, and I know we've all done this, if, let's say you're in the mall, you're walking along and you see this big uh, glass in front of the store and it has an unusual reflection to it. Some, some big store glasses will do that. And you'll glance real quick and then you just keep on going. So you see yourself and you glance, you go on. Well, the mirror he's talking about is looking into intently. That, that you look at it, you study it, uh, based on what you see, you make decisions to change things. So it's an intentional look. It's looking intently that, that you desire that that looking make a difference. And this is how he uses the different word for that. Uh, and you're looking into the perfect law of liberty. James, perhaps, because he's writing to individuals who used to be Jewish and now they're Jewish Christians, He's going to He's use this, this word, this expression, this expression law, of law of liberty. Uh, He's, going He's going to also talk about the royal law. And he's, and he's going, going to define, define it in such a way, such a way that, it's that it's going to be focused, focused on, others, on others. That both, that both the perfect law of liberty, liberty means, that means that you are free, you are free in, a number, in a number of ways. First of all, you're free, free from, from this kind, this kind of... of um, Filthy, filthy living, living he's talked about. about. If you're, if you're looking, looking intently into the word, the word will free you from that. But 
but you're, but also, you're also free, free to, live to live for others. others. In just, in a, just moment, a moment, he is going, he is to, going indicate to indicate who the, who the others are, are. but you, but are, you are, free. are free. And, and that, that perfect, perfect law, law of liberty, liberty the, law the law itself, itself the, the revelation, revelation of God, of God. And it's understood, it's understood that here's the perfect, perfect law of liberty, law of liberty is embodied in body Jesus. Jesus. If you're to ask the question, okay, okay, okay. who's the who's one, one that embodies, embodies this perfect, perfect law, of law of liberty to the best, the best you could ever have as a model? model. James will say, James Jesus, with Jesus, of course. Of course. And, and it is, it is uh, the revelation, revelation of God. God is, is perfect, perfect in how, how not only God has God revealed his build, but his desire, desire that it that shape, shape quip, and mold us, us to be able to, to be serve able to others, others with what he, what he calls, calls is true, is true and acceptable, acceptable religion. religion. And then he and says, then he because, says because, because you continue, you continue to do this, this you're, you're closely, closely continue to do it. You're not a forgetful hearer. Um, have you noticed that as you get older and older, you get things. things. You can hear you can things, hear things <laughs> and forget them. them. And it doesn't, and it doesn't take long. long. You may be, you may be 15, 15 minutes later, later so I have somebody to you. Oh, do, do you remember what I told you? Oh, uh, uh, did you remind me? me. <laughs> we forget so quickly, don't we? And he's using that to say, you're not a forgetful hearer. You're listening. You're intent on what you're hearing because you want it to be used. But you're but a you're doer, a doer of, the of the word. Now here's, now here's what's, what's interesting. interesting. At this At point, this point um, where he says in verse 25, not forgetting not what he's heard, heard, but doing it. it. Literally, it's Literally, a doer it's of a doer the word. word. It's, it's real it's general. general. Uh, he's not going to specify, not gonna specify anything, anything until he gets until to the next two verses. verses. But at this but point, it's just a general principle that you're going to do what you intently look into, and when that's your intent, this is the blessed life. You're blessed in that work. And I, I thought about that um, through the years. It's sort of dawned on me that one of the blessings of the Christian life is an involved Christian life. When I'm doing something and I'm in the midst of a work or a good deed, responding to a particular need, not only is the person being blessed that I'm responding to, because a lot of times we think of that, don't we? That, that person is being blessed because of what I'm doing. But we need to also know that, that in God's grand design, when I'm responding to a need, I am being blessed while I'm doing that. I am blessed in my doing. And it took me a long time to understand that. I'm blessed in my doing. Because we don't often talk about that being a blessing. We always talk about, well, the finished work for somebody, that was a blessing. Or it was a, I had a blessed opportunity to do something. But we never talk about in the doing of the work itself, that's a blessing. And, and maybe we need to get our minds around that a little bit more than we do. But we're blessed in that kind of doing. Oh, and I don't have time to look at. I've been amazed as I was going through the New Testament looking at this idea of worthless religion. Several things are perceived by God as being worthless. Um, and in Titus, let's just look at one. Look at Titus 3 and uh, verse 9. And, and what I thought was interesting was this is in the same kind of setting of James. Titus 3, 9. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless or worthless. Sometimes people can get involved in all kinds of religious discussions and arguments that are useless. Have you ever <laughs> experienced that? And he's very clear about this. You just avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. And because you know, they're, not, they're unprofitable. You're not, you're not going to be pleasing to God. You're certainly not going to serve anybody and make a difference when you're caught up in that mode. And for Titus, it too is a section on godly living. As James continues talking about this, it has to do with the bridling of one's tongue. 
Now, when we get to chapter 3, we're going to have a whole section on the tongue. But this is the first hint that we get. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Here again, a, a reference to self-deception. If you're claiming you're really religious, but your mouth just goes, and you don't keep a tight rein on what you say and on your tongue, you're deceiving yourself, and your religion is totally useless. And that's it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Um, but you can see that, and we've all seen how true that is. Uh, twice there's a reference now in just this one section uh, about self-deception because I think what James is driving at is one of the purposes of God is that religion or our relationship with God is meant to unmask us. Religion is never meant, was never meant by God to be a facade that we can hide behind and to prove we're better than others. Uh, since God is the one who knows human hearts, it would appear that we're just a collection of believers whose hearts are known by God. And that's a pretty scary thing. God knows all of our hearts. Now, the acceptable religion, he defines as being pure and faultless or undefiled. And this is the opposite of holy. And he says specifically it means to visit or to take care of or to respond to others' needs. And Jesus gives this parable, remember in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, they get separated. What's the difference between the sheep and the goats? The goats didn't do anything and the sheep did. They responded to the needs of others who were in despair. And you're supposed to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now this doesn't mean, see, think about this. It's the same thing that Paul says, or I mean John, you can't take yourself out of the world. You know, we're living in the world, so we got to live here. But how do you live in a relationship to a world and to a culture that may embrace values and a living style that is opposite of the Lord's? So to keep yourself unspotted from the world seems to me includes things like spiritual discernment, that you're not, you're not going to write people off and say, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with people. But you're going to be wise enough to know where you should and shouldn't go, where you, what you should say and shouldn't say, and not let the world pour you into its mold. Because you've got a message of salvation for the world. You don't want the world to have a message that shapes and destroys you. And later on in chapter 4, James, again, is going to pick up on this particular theme. So this is a fascinating section here at the end of chapter 1 where it deals with listening and doing and the kind of religion that God's really looking for. And it may be that too often in the past we haven't emphasized enough what Scripture says God's really looking for, if you think about it. Well, let's end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this entire passage challenges us. Uh, it is easy for us to listen and hear the word. Help us to be committed to doing it. Especially as James lays it out. Father, we know that there are people around us who have needs that are desperate, that are crying out for guidance and some care and compassion. Help us to be very open and sensitive to those uh, moments and those times when, when we can be Jesus to them. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that you do provide us to respond to the widows and orphans in our society, uh, in our town, in our culture around us. And we pray that we will be faithful to those moments and that we'll also be very careful as to how we use our speech so that it will not um, negate our witness as a follower of Jesus. Thank you, God, for this opportunity and for our being here tonight. And we pray that all we have said and done will be to your honor, praise, and glory. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here.